context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for a continued aggressive and transformational response. Uh, this is a very simple question that we all here at the Capitol have to ask and answer. Is this an extraordinary event that has afflicted the American people or not? If it's an extraordinary event, then the congressional COVID-19 pandemic response should be extraordinary as well. And we, as House Democrats, believe it's an extraordinary event. Almost 200,000 Americans have died. That is more than the number of Americans who died during the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, 9-11, the war in Iraq, and the war in Afghanistan combined. More than 100,000 small businesses have permanently closed. More than 6 million Americans have been infected by the coronavirus and counting. And tens of millions of Americans remain unemployed or underemployed, many of whom are food insecure and don't know how they're going to provide for their families. That's an extraordinary event afflicting the American people. It requires an extraordinary congressional response. And that's all we are simply asking our Republican colleagues to recognize. The HEROES Act was passed 123 days ago. And they've now decided within the last few days that we should be doing something, albeit incredibly inadequate. That's why we are where we are right now in Washington, D.C. But as always, we remain committed to trying to get something done. And we expect to be here as long as it takes in order to get something done on behalf of the American people, to provide another round of direct stimulus payments to everyday Americans, to provide relief to tenants and homeowners, similar to what was done in the HEROES Act of approximately $175 billion, to extend the emergency unemployment insurance benefit because we are in a recession and in some parts of the country facing depression-like conditions, to make sure that we provide assistance to our state and local governments in order to protect public health, public safety, public education, public transportation, public well-being, and the provision of the public goods that are done by our state and local governments. And so the caucus remains unified, committed to getting something done that's meaningful, and to remaining in town as long as it takes for that to happen. Let me now yield uh, to our distinguished vice chair of the caucus from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Catherine Clark. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Six months into a pandemic that has caused such loss of life and of livelihoods, workers are worried, businesses are closing, families are in mourning, Senate Republicans are burying their heads in the sand. Four months ago, we passed the HEROES Act. And what was it met with from Mitch McConnell? He said states should go bankrupt. He said we're going to hit the pause button on American families. We passed legislation, as the chairman outlined, that met the size of the need. 
that met the urgency and the need for action. But while we acted, Mitch McConnell decided to wait and see. It is what it is, as the president said. Last week, they decided to scramble together a bill here in the vernacular of D.C. called a skinny bill. But what did it really mean? It meant zero in increasing food as one in 10 Americans are struggling with hunger. It meant zero for rent relief as 40 percent of all renting households risk being removed from their homes. It meant cutting unemployment assistance in half as one in six Americans cannot find work. And that is even a greater burden on working women in this country. It meant one third of the funding necessary to stabilize and save our child care industry, which is fundamental to our recovery. Once again, callous indifference. We're not asking the Senate to cave in. We are asking them to care about Americans at home. And what do we have from the White House? We have him saying uh, yet again what we know he believes. Science doesn't know. Science doesn't matter. There's no climate change. He's downplayed this crisis from the beginning. He is slowing testing to influence poll numbers instead of protecting security of Americans, and he's interfering with CDC reporting. Until we get control of this virus and have healthy people, we will not have a healthy economy. We will not be able to rebuild, recover, and reopen. It's that simple. So we are here as a Democratic caucus united to continue to advocate for holistic, science-based solutions that will meet this extraordinarily difficult moment in American history. We are here to fight for the people, and we will stay in Washington until we're successful. meaningful mean? Does that mean a deal with Republicans? Does that mean another House pass bill? Can you define what a meaningful COVID relief bill is? Well, meaningful means an agreement on behalf of the American people that meets the size and scope of the problem. Uh, and so we have negotiated four different bipartisan bills under the extraordinary leadership of Speaker Pelosi. And we look forward to arriving at another bipartisan agreement. Uh, but in order for that to happen, we have to have partners who are willing to meet the moment. Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer have publicly said we are willing to come down from the $3.4 trillion Heroes Act uh, to at least $2.4 trillion and then try to find common ground at that point. That is an incredibly reasonable public negotiating concession. But we have to have partners willing uh, to do something meaningful in terms of providing relief to the American people. And Mitch McConnell, by the way, is negotiating against himself. At the end of July, he introduced legislation or publicly floated that the Republican Senate perspective was a trillion dollar intervention. Now, how do you go from a trillion dollars in July to $650 billion in September when the number of deaths, the number of infections, the amount of pain and suffering being felt and experienced by the American people hasn't decreased, it's increased. That's the kind of unreasonable person, as Catherine outlined, that we're dealing with. Donald Trump and the Senate Republican response continues to evidence a depraved indifference to human life. It's the only way that I can explain what's happening. That said, we, again, are committed to finding common ground 
and not leaving town until we accomplish that objective. So to be clear, you will not leave town until there is a deal with the administration on a COVID relief bill. I'm going to yield to Catherine as well, but I believe that that is the perspective that is widely shared by the House Democratic Caucus and was repeatedly articulated on the caucus call today. The schedule, of course, will be determined by the speaker and Majority Leader Hoyer, who probably will have more to say on this later on this afternoon. But it's clear to me, based on the calls that have taken place up until this point and the caucus meeting today, that the overwhelming consensus amongst the members is that we stick around until we get something done for the American people. Uh, so the Problem Solvers Caucus is getting ready to roll out, they're holding a press conference pretty much right after this, um, rolling out their idea for bipartisan coronavirus legislation. Is your caucus pushing for something like that? We know that the dollar amount isn't quite going to match the HEROES Act. Um, and you guys are still talking about the HEROES Act in terms of a metric for the kind of relief that's needed. Is your caucus leaning which way? HEROES Act? where they want the 4.3 or something like the Problem Solvers Caucus's bill that they're introducing? Well, the HEROES Act, I think, is the foundation for the type of transformational intervention that is necessary because this is an extraordinary crisis. That said, Speaker Pelosi, I think, has articulated the caucus perspective, which is we recognize that Senate Republicans are in a vastly different place, and so is the administration and we're willing to come down by at least a trillion dollars. We'll see what the Problem Solvers Caucus proposal uh, is. I've got great respect, you know, for Josh Gottheimer, and I think uh, he, he is of the same view, and we'll hear what he has to say, is that we need to arrive at an agreement, but it's got to be a strong and meaningful agreement. I just want to underscore what the, what the chairman said, that the speaker has said, I'll meet you halfway. There's no greater start to a negotiation than that. But she has been left alone at the negotiating table for weeks and weeks after making that offer. So I am grateful that I have colleagues on both sides of the aisle who are trying to work towards a solution. And that's what we need to see from the Senate. See what is happening to American families and act accordingly. Uh, you know, what, what is the problem? There was no hesitation on huge spending when it came to tax cuts for the very wealthiest of Americans. So what is the hesitation now in helping people who are in such need and who are depending on Congress? especially with state and local budgets that have nowhere else to turn but to us for the help. And this isn't about a red state or blue state that will always be the go-to for this president, to lead with division. This is about how we respond as a country, how we follow the science and have testing and tracing, how we safely reopen our schools and save our child care sector. These are the critical issues facing us, and we have to come to them together. And I hope that the Republicans on the problem solvers will be an inspiration to the Senate to come and join us back at the negotiating table. So are Democrats willing to come down anything below the $2 trillion number? And given that negotiations have been kind of rocky in the past, over the past couple of months, what's the level of concern of not being able to have vulnerable members being able to go home and campaign should these negotiations kind of go into October? Well, our concern remains with the health, safety, and well-being of the American people. Uh, and that's, I think, the approach that we've taken as House Democrats. Uh, because we've got a solemn responsibility to try to deliver for the people and make they, their life better in the context of this very deadly pandemic. If we were playing politics, some would argue, we wouldn't be at the negotiating table willing to agree to meaningful relief 49 days before an election. But this is not about politics for us. It's about getting things done on behalf of the American people. Back. 
So will, will Democrats be voting on anything, whether it's an, uh, the HEROES Act, which, as you said, hasn't been voted on in several months, re-voting on that, voting on a, a, a different piece of coronavirus legislation, or will it only be that bipartisan deal once it's reached? Well, that's a question that I think um, will have to be discussed, you know, at the leadership level between the Speaker and Steny uh, and Jim Clyburn, of course, with some input, significant input from the members. Uh, there was no real discussion of that on the call today. Was there discussion on the call today of the MORE Act that would deschedule marijuana? I know it's scheduled for a vote next week, and but there's been some con concern about that. Yeah, there was no discussion on the MORE Act today. Uh, speaking about the marijuana legislation, there are some frontline members that are obviously concerned about you guys moving forward with that, but yet not having a stimulus package. Are there still plans to move forward with the marijuana legislation? And what do you tell some of those vulnerable members who are concerned about the optics of it? We didn't discuss... Uh, the more act on the call today uh, or the timing of some of the bills that are going to be on the floor next week. We did discuss the legislative agenda for this week. Uh, but again, I think the primary sentiment amongst all of us is that are we in the midst of a deadly pandemic or not? Because Donald Trump and the Republicans want to act like this is not happening. Let's be clear. That's their general perspective. It's not really happening, even though we all know people who have died from the COVID-19 pandemic, and we all know Americans who are suffering economically. It's happening. We should intervene in a meaningful way. And I think that is the primary focus. With respect to some of the other items on the legislative agenda, particularly as it relates to uh, next week, I'm just trying to get to tomorrow, right? That's the approach that many of us have taken in the context of the long national nightmare that has been the Trump administration since January 20th uh, of 2017. Just to follow up on that, sorry, Ma uh, Majority Leader McConnell yesterday accused Democrats of being more willing to focus on marijuana than on coronavirus. What would you say in response to that? Well, I'm going to yield to Captain Clark, but she said it earlier. Mitch McConnell's perspective has been uh, that states should declare bankruptcy, which is ridiculous when you consider the fact that the states he's talking about, New York, California, New Jersey, Illinois, for instance, regularly provide tens of billions of dollars more to the federal government than we get back in return. And all we're saying is that this is not a blue state issue or a red state issue. It's an American issue. And I think the comment about marijuana is just silliness. They care more about the wealthy, the well-off, and the well-connected. We know that's a fact because the first thing that they did of any meaningful consequence from their ideological perspective when they had the House, the Senate, and the presidency was passed the GOP tax scam, where 83% of the benefits went to the wealthiest 1%. And now Mitch McConnell wants to lecture us about a legislative agenda when you, you, you basically have saddled our children and grandchildren with $2 trillion worth of debt to promote the lifestyles of the rich and shameless, and now you want to talk to us because we are trying to hold the line for everyday Americans. It's just a silly comment. Catherine. Yeah, it's silly, <clears throat> and it is so disrespectful to the losses that I hear about every single day in my district. The calls I get from a single mom last week who was in tears. She doesn't know how she can afford her childcare any longer. And she has a special needs child who needs that sort of educational experience when her hours are cut. And if she's not able to put that together, then she's going to lose her job entirely. Maybe Mitch McConnell should talk to the veteran from my hometown who was so worried because his medication was over a week late getting to him in the mail that he relies on. Maybe Mitch McConnell should talk to the school board members and the teachers and the parents of students 
who are so worried about how their schools are going to open and stay open and how we are not going to leave children behind, not for the six months they've already missed, but the impact for years on some of our kids and their education. Maybe Mitch McConnell should be worried about the over 400 bills we've passed in the last session that take on a range of issues that are sitting on his desk collecting dust. Maybe he should be worried about protecting every single American, wherever they live, whoever they're voting for, right to vote in this country and making sure that they have the right to cast a ballot free from foreign interference and on time because we have a post office that can deliver. Maybe those are some of the worries Mitch McConnell should be talking about. Second row. Oh, um, in addition to coronavirus and the marijuana bill that's coming up, is there going to be any additional legislation on police reform or any way to address that issue, given that there's been gridlock on that for, for months now? Is, is there a way forward before the uh, election on that? Well, as I understand it, there are ongoing conversations between uh, Chairwoman Karen Bass, the uh, lead author of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, and Tim Scott. You'd have to talk to Chairwoman Bass to understand the status of those discussions. Uh, but as with other pieces of legislation, uh, we remain committed to trying to get something done and are willing to work with the Senate to arrive at uh, doing something to solve the problem. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is the only bipartisan game in town. It received Republican support on the floor of the House of Representatives, despite the fact that Leader McCarthy was strongly whipping against it. And there are more Republicans throughout the country at the state and local level who see and support the need for doing something constructive along the lines of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Hopefully, Senate Republicans will see it that way at some point. Not only are we going to continue to to press for that bill, but I think it's important that just today we're going to be voting on the Strength in Diversity Act uh, by Representative Marsha Fudge. Uh, we are going to be looking at the Equity and Inclusion Enforcement Act uh, by Representative Scott. We are going to be condemning all forms of anti-Asian sentiment as related to COVID-19, sponsored by Representative Meng. And we're going to have the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, sponsored by Representative Nadler. This is the type of work for the people, looking at how we continue to address systemic racism in our country that we are continuing to do while very much keeping our response to this pandemic uh, top of mind. All of these issues are about the security of every single American and continues to be the focus and priority of this caucus. Last question. We'll go, okay, we'll, we'll take these last two. Thank you. Oh, great. Mine's, I think, easy. Um, does the caucus have a position on when the CR date should be should be extended or ended or whatever? Uh, there was no real discussion of that on the call today. I think the caucus position is we want to see an agreement as it relates to making sure that the government is not shut down. The last thing that should occur in the midst of this pandemic and all of the chaos, crisis, and confusion that has been uh, wrought upon the American people by Donald Trump is a government shutdown. Uh, and so there's an expectation as Speaker Pelosi has said, and as Steny Hoyer has said, that we will arrive at an agreement in terms of a continuing resolution, but there's been no discussion, uh, certainly on the call today, about the date uh, that will be in that agreement. Do you have an opinion? Uh, I've got no opinion other than that um, we have to avoid at all costs a shutdown, and I expect that we're going to find common ground with the Senate because it doesn't appear that Senator McConnell uh, and the Republicans want to shut down either. 
Um, and then my question kind of actually piggybacks off of that. How long is going to be too long in waiting for this coronavirus legislation to get done? Because you all have now said, and Speaker Pelosi said it on CNBC, that you all are going to be in town as long as it takes. But government funding, you know, there is a deadline for that. Do you guys see that as a similar deadline? Or do you think that right before that, your caucus might start to fracture if the negotiations are taking too long? I'm going to yield to Catherine on this as well. But the caucus remains united as has been the case through tough negotiations that have occurred throughout the balance of the 116th Congress. Uh, we were in a similar situation in the midst of Donald Trump's reckless 35-day government shutdown. And of course, our constituents were anxious in the midst of that. And we had people who were furloughed, people who were working without pay, on the front lines of our national security. Uh, and it was quite unfortunate what the American people were forced to go through. Uh, but we held together as a caucus, unified behind Speaker Pelosi's leadership, and we ended that reckless 35-day government shutdown, and we didn't give Donald Trump a dime to do it. Because our unity is our strength. Uh, we undertook a very tough set of negotiations in the context of the U.S.-Canada-Mexico uh, trade agreement, the USMCA. And with respect to that agreement, uh, there were some voices on the outside that didn't think Democrats would hold firm together in the face of the administration basically saying, initially, take it or leave it my way or the highway. And we've always been willing to say, there is I-95 if you are unwilling to come to a legitimate, meaningful agreement on behalf of the American people. And we held together under Speaker Pelosi's tremendous leadership and Richie Neal's tremendous leadership. And in the end, we transformed that agreement into something meaningful on behalf of working class, unionized, everyday Americans. And a similar thing happened with, I think, what many have referred to as COVID 3.5. When, you know, Mitch McConnell came to the floor of the Senate and basically said, the money for the Paycheck Protection Program has run out, and so we're just going to straight reauthorize or refill uh, the resources needed to continue that program, take it or leave it, my way or the highway. And we showed him the highway because it would have made no sense at that point when there were so many small businesses who were not getting the relief that were intended to get the relief and simply to swallow what Mitch McConnell wanted to do. And it was a lot of pressure to try to break the House Democratic Caucus, but we stood firm on behalf of the American people and we were able to secure tens of billions of dollars in additional resources uh, to make sure that women and minority-owned businesses, mom-and-pop shops, family-owned businesses, community banks, community development financial institutions received the relief. And so when you talk about whether we're under pressure right now, of course, this job is filled with pressure. This is why we get paid the medium bucks. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what we've shown is a willingness to stand strong and unified on behalf of the American people. And when we do, it always yields a better result. I wish there was a relief from this pandemic and the economic fallout it's caused for the American people, but there isn't. And we cannot let Mitch McConnell try to run a congressional calendar out on the suffering. And so we are going to stand strong and we are going to bring the voices of our constituents and families across this country uh, here to Congress and say that we see you and we're going to fight for you. And we will, we will do that until we have relief for them, until we can show them that their security is the priority of this Congress and their government.